10 years ago, I was a new channel leader at a startup. I was building a channel program, I was hiring partner account managers, and I was beginning to recruit partners. And so as I started to call partners and find out where they would be over the next coming weeks, I found that many of them would be at a conference. And so like any frugal leader, I decided to descend upon that conference and sit in the lobby and have my partner meetings. As I was waiting for my first meeting to attend, I got a phone call, and it was the Blackberry days. So there was no chance to go scam likely and decline the call. It was from a 206 area code. And the voice on the phone said, hi, I'm a recruiter from F5 Networks. And in all honesty, I looked around, wondering if I was on some kind of channel, candid camera. Because I had been sitting in the lobby of the Hyatt McCormick Place, where F5's Agility Conference was going on, looking to recruit those partners who had a synergistic view as we did. I said no, thank you very much, as my next meeting was coming. But what planted in my head that day was the, the asking our partners, what did they like about F5? What I heard that day laid a seed that today is still there and growing and flourishing within the channel community. I heard that they appreciated F5's transparency, that they thought that they were recognized for their value, and that they were great people to work with. And for those of you who work with the channel, you know that having the high praise like that is often rare. And so I knew there was something special. And when a week later, the channel leader who was looking to recruit me called me himself and said, I hear you don't want to talk to us, I took the leap. Ten years later, I am thrilled to represent F5, our channel partners, and our customers here with you today. So it occurred to me that not everybody knows who F5 is. But I bet that you've experienced F5 and you didn't even know it. When you've had a digital experience with a bank, with a mortgage company refinancing, with a food delivery app, F5 is behind those apps, making that digital experience better. F5 empowers its customers, the world's largest enterprises, service providers, financial institutions, educational institutions, government entities, and consumer brands to deliver the best digital experiences. We make apps go faster, smarter, and safer. It would be strange for any f 5 to talk about our business and miss the conversation about our culture. And those seeds that I was talking about that I heard from our channel partners that day are alive and well within F5. Just a few years ago, we put together this framework that you're seeing. It is what being F5 is all about. Our culture is in everything we do. And you see this with every F5er every day. And it's something that we bring to our channel partners as well and they recognize this in us. We are still a company that works transparently, honestly, and we are pro our partner's contribution. But we're on a journey much like the rest of you. We started in the 90s making the dot-coms better, using hardware load balancing, and over the last decade, we've been working with mission-critical enterprise applications that needed to scale globally and be secure. But this next evolution that we're on is all about how we are transforming to a multi-cloud security and delivery company. And with that evolution, we want to fuel what we're calling adaptive apps. These are apps that learn and grow. They're automated. They help the customers that we work with focus on their core businesses and win every day in that 
customer-facing view that we've all experienced. Their brand is that digital experience. How often will you be frustrated and not go back to that brand when the website or the app doesn't work? It makes or breaks, and that's where F5 is in this. We're bringing adaptive applications to life. As we think about our next evolution as a company, enabling adaptive apps for our customers is key. And in order to live out that mission, we've acquired four companies in four years. I can tell you being an F5er has not been dull. These acquisitions will allow us to bring this adaptive application vision to life faster, reaching new and modern apps in new locations, including the network edge, and offering sophisticated AI-driven security insights. However, like any renovation project, the bringing together of these companies is a challenge. It's one where we've acquired amazing technology that didn't always have a sophisticated go-to-market strategy as F5 did as we started, in, especially in our hardware legacy. Like so many of our industry peers, our systems and our processes have not necessarily been kept up to date in order to make this transition, and we are actively at it. But some of the things that JB said to me yesterday was a live and chatting on our Teams channel for all the F5ers who are here. We said, that's us. We see it. We're having the challenges with things like CPQ and our customer-facing systems. In fact, our, you know, our support organization has done an amazing job of trying to bring this all together in a project. We're seeing it. We're living it right now. And with all this amazing technology and all these new F5ers, we realized it was time that we gave our organization some real clarity in how we work. And our CEO gave all of us three imperatives. These imperatives about bringing our vision for adaptive applications to life, transforming how customers experience F5, and capturing the explosive growth opportunity that we see with security and software has become a battle cry for all of us. It's become a way for us all to ladder down the goals of our teams in order to come around this goal. But as a channel leader, I will tell you that our bridge into the future is challenged. How do we bring our partners along on this journey? How do we transform as an, to an as-a-service company and bring these partners across the bridge with us? Our bridge, probably like many of yours, has been pretty static for the last 13 plus years of this program. It's focused on traditional ways of measuring our partners. That precious metal system, platinum, gold, silver, authorized in our case, it's one that hasn't recognized what the partners are bringing individually to the table, what their specialties are, what that secret sauce that they can do with us and for our joint customers in evolving to this as-a-service work. So we are thinking about this transformation within my organization and throughout the company as a renovation, looking at keeping what is the best of what we have and evolving what we need to evolve. And a major part of this work is how we work with our channel partners. So today I'm going to tell you about how we are embarking on this journey. I will tell you, and I call it embarking, because like many of you, we are not through this model at all. We are learning as we go. And I'm hoping what you get from me today is an understanding about how we're approaching the challenge and some of the learnings that we have. Hopefully, my goal is to help you skip some of the hard potholes that we've fallen into and help build your bridge for the future. Now, I laughed yesterday. I actually didn't know this is like the industry's most hated model. Um, but I can tell you, I was just talking to Thomas about the fact that you know, five years ago, I heard about TSIA being out and working with us and about how we thought we would never get stuck in the fish. And as we're bringing all these companies together, 
we are facing many of the same challenges that you are. And I can tell you from a channel point of view, it's alive as a challenge that we have to overcome right now. But we're moving in the right direction. And we've taken an approach of looking at this in three chapters. Plan, build, and maintain. So as we look at the plan mode, the first thing we did was align to our executive goals, those three imperatives that I gave you. It was key for my team to understand, and it was key for us to share that with the partner community so they knew where we were going. We focused on partner experience. It was something that we actually had to bring into the future. It was pretty lame how we were interacting with our partners, and our digital systems for that needed to come up to industry standard. And we leveraged industry experts, including TSIA and the folks within CRN's iPad team, Forrester, and others. We built a cross-functional team across the company. And in fact, in bringing that cross-functional team together, we were able to leverage Anne McClelland and this as-a-service channel optimization practice to run a workshop, which quite honestly gave us a chance to break down barriers between teams like finance, accounting, manufacturing, product management, so that folks could understand what the channel did. Quite honestly, I'm still surprised today when I have a conversation with someone and they don't know. Now, I'll let you know, we're 90% plus channel. Every deal, for that matter, touches a channel partner. So it was an interesting process of understanding what people understood about what we do, the scale and breadth that we provide the company, and some of the unique values that we bring that only come from dealing with our channel partners. And we needed to understand our needs for the future, as well as what levers we were going to have. Because without that, we were going to set ourselves up for failure. And, we, and quite honestly, we needed to understand when and how we would get these things. So the first thing we did is we aligned our channel goals to this set of imperatives. We made all of our go-to-market programs, campaigns that we did from a marketing standpoint, incentives, and our own internal KPIs with our channel team aligned with the imperatives and the missions that sit under those imperatives to help bring those three goals to life. We've talked about how do we have to evolve the role of the channel partner and make sure that their experience remains a focus for us. We needed to transform our value exchange with the partners from what had been really a very traditional land and renew motion to one focused on how we got our products adopted and expanded to new use cases inside of our joint customers. But we knew, like many of you are experiencing, that channel scale is highly dependent on tools and technology. Telemetry to help our partners understand where the customer is in their adoption cycle. APIs to speed the information back and forth between their systems. Many of our partners are ahead of us in their implementations of Gainsight and other technologies and building bridges between our Gainsight implementation as well as theirs. So these are things that we are real, realizing and needing to contemplate in our build mode. But one of the other things that we needed to do is we needed to know what a partner of the future was going to look like for F5. We knew we needed them, but we had to sit down and redefine what that value exchange was going to look like and what we needed from them. By the way, we took this out to partners, and we got their buy-in in this process. This came out of doing a voice of the partner study that we did but we also took that internally. We asked internal team members and stakeholders to answer these questions. What does it look like in the future? And what we found is that our partner of the future is going to be insights driven. They're going to have real-time information about what is going on within the customer. 
they're going to be able to proactively inform decisions about how they can help that customer realize the best benefits the products can offer them. It would be solution focused. And this is where we could take the opportunity to recognize what our partners were good at and maybe not what they're not good at and focus on the right partners with the right message. We had gone from being a one platform company to being a multi platform company. The same partners weren't always right for every message. They were going to be consultative sell sellers. In many cases, our partners work much higher and much wider in an account than we do. And so selling high and wide with them inside these customer accounts, helping them understand the why, the why bringing the adaptive applications vision to life was going to be a propellant for their customer and for their business. And we were going to share success. Deep collaborative relationships that we had established would continue, and they'd clearly understand our value proposition. And we've been in the plan mode. Leveraging third party research, both internally and externally. And I can't stress how important it is for you to start that transparent communication with your partner community today. Help them understand where they are. Leverage folks like TSIA to do briefings to help them understand. I would argue, do that with your own partner teams as well. We've done that. We had in our sales kickoff last year, Anne McClellan speak to our partner account managers so that they could understand this transition that was ahead of us. Build that internal buy-in and advocacy. I can't tell you what came out of that workshop was relationships and understanding of where we fit in the go-to-market and why those teams needed to recognize that if they didn't think about us as they planned how they were going to evolve their ways of working in this as a service industry change, that they would miss a step in taking our channel partners along with it. And data. And I will tell you, this will be all of our challenge, is how do we make that data available and insights driven to allow not only our own employees, but that of our partners to activate this new go-to-market. And adopt an agile approach to your program. A lot of our channel programs have been static for a very long time. Ours was static for 13 plus years. Now, it was beloved. All those things I heard in the lobby 10 years ago at the Hyatt McCormick place are the things the partners still appreciate our, about our program our recognition of their role, whether they're initiating the opportunity or helping us get it closed. The fact that we see the partner value in that is key, and it's key to how we work in the future. But we're also going to have to recognize that the programs have to change. And so taking this agile approach means that we're communicating transparently to our partners that we're going to try things. And in that doing pilots, we're going to find the best ways of working. And so we've embarked on that. So one of the things that we've done is we've taken a cohort of partners. And we've been really clear with them what transition we're going through. We've told them that as a service will be an important part of our business by 2025. We've told them that we need to create a new value exchange with them. We've gotten their feedback in that process, but obviously we've got a lead with how we're going to grow and expand our opportunity in this as a service market. We told them that we will reward joint success just like we do today, but very much focused on end user outcomes. And we said that we will continue to increase loyalty with them that we will focus on the life cycle that we work with the customer. We'll see them for the job that they do in helping us retain and grow these customers. And as we hit more and more of our subscription and as-a-service products, we'd be focusing on helping them 
help us reduce churn. And so we exposed them in that workshop that we did with our partners to the layer model. Now many, especially ones who have much bigger vendor relationships, were already there. They were already being driven by the likes of Cisco and Microsoft. Thank you very much, by the way, Cisco and Microsoft, for helping the partners get to the point that they're at. But we needed them to understand that we were there too now. And this focus on the center of the layer model, adopt and expand, was going to be a future focus for us. And so we introduced a subscription pilot program with a small cohort of partners. We chose these partners because they had already led within our community on selling our subscription products. We told them that we would run this program at the same time we were running our other incentive-based programs for them, and that we would pay them the better of the two for helping us learn and get the kinks out of the system. And so in this program, and this is just for you know, illustration purposes, what we do is we look at the starting ARR in a given quarter. And then we take into account whether we've had churn, whether we've had consolidation. So has that customer moved to another one of our programs? So have they moved out of subscription, a one-year subscription program into a three-year EA or ELA? We would look at what that looks like. Did we see contraction in what they did? And we would focus on giving them the tools to help them cross-sell the portfolio and upsell more F5 into their customers. And we do some math with them. And in fact, one of the things we also told them is that we would much more focus on growth in our early learnings than we would on that retain piece. Mainly so that they understood that selling more subscriptions, working in this way with us is actually absolutely where we're focused. Now, sell the right thing to the right customer, but don't worry about this being a penalization. Again, we're running our programs side by side right now, our incentive programs, and we wanted them to help us get through our learnings here so we can think about expanding this, especially as we get more telemetry data and more information that we're able to share. So one of the things that I thought was going to be most helpful is tell you some of the learnings that we've had out of the six months that we've been running this program. We've realized that in order for this to be a truly compelling message to our partners, we needed to make sure that they had a larger base of this subscription product. They needed to have more opportunity there or it wasn't going to line up to them to be a big enough opportunity to focus on. We needed to be continued to be transparent with them. And I think one of those things came from, is the model too complex to understand? Is it a one, two, three? Remember, those partners don't work for you. They work with you. Your logo is not on their paycheck. And so making it compelling to them is a really key part. And helping them understand how it's all calculated needs to be simple. And the models needed to be win-win. They needed to know that we were focused on seeing them succeed. And we were willing to incentivize for that. And one of the very big learnings was understanding that we needed to help our partners understand how to activate the adoption and expansion motion. We needed to be able to build specialization programs. We needed to be able to build out customer success programs where they could be a part of that motion. Those are things that we are still building within our own organization, especially as we bring all of these companies together in our new model. 
So it's been key, and it's been the driver for what my team in our global programs team is working to build out. Practice building, new specializations within our program, teaching them how to expand use cases over what's already at the customer, logically, and ones that are in benefit to that customer, meeting and seeing the adaptive application vision come to life within their own organizations. So we are not nearly at the maintain mode right now, but we're already having the conversation about what we need to do to make sure that that maintain motion is there. We're getting ahead of that right now in understanding what we will have to do. And it's part of this being transparent with our partners. We know that we're going to have to continue to be agile and evaluate as we go. We're going to need to take in those feedback loops, not only from our own company, but from that of our partners and our customers. It's become apparent in our business that our global customers want to work differently with us. In some cases, that means working in new models. In some cases, it means allowing the partners who serve them in a given geo to work in a more expanded way of working. These are all things we're contemplating as we go through this renovation. We have to continue to leverage data and pressure test our success metrics. What does success look like? Are those goals too large? Showing them where our North Star is, but being very conservative and logical in that process, we know we're going to have to do it. And for my team, whether it's in the field or whether it's in our corporate offices, it's about being an advocate for our partners, helping them understand the unique things that this partner community gives us. It's where most of our net new accounts come from. It's where we see cross-sell opportunities. We might have gotten into that account in a very um, application delivery mindset. And as we've expanded to security, it's our partners who've helped us get there. So we need to continue as a channel organization to be the advocate for our partners in our new and evolving go-to-markets. So as I take you through some of the best practices for right now and what, where we are in our journey, I thought this would be helpful. Definitely align and time your focus areas to imperatives that your company has. Show your partners where your North Star is. Give them the timeline. I saw a great presentation given by HPE yesterday that laid that out on a timeline. Share that with your partners. Help them understand that for us, 2025 is where we expect as a service to be a tremendous contributor to our business. They need to know that that is coming. Prioritize partner experience. That same digital experience that we know our customers are building for their customers, that we are building for our customers, we need to extend that to our partner community. We need to make them more agile, we need to give them information in the ways that they want to consume it. I will come back to the building that cross-functional team across the company. For the channel leaders listening today, you'd be surprised how many people do not completely understand in your organizations what you do every day, what your partners do every day for your brand. So go on that mission, be an evangelist for what the partners bring to your organization and build that cross-functional team. In many cases, it was that workshop where we got everyone together, where across the company, we realized we weren't as ready. We were more inside that fish than we were willing to admit. Leverage industry experts. And when I talk about industry experts, I don't just mean the likes of TSIA or IPED or other, or Forrester, who, by the way, have been tremendous in helping us get there. But leverage your community. I have never found a challenge that another channel leader wasn't going through themselves. I have been floored 
at the generosity of sharing stories and best practices that the channel community is willing to do. We are all advocating for taking our partners on this renovation journey with us. And so talk to your peers in the industry. It, it, is a, it is the key way that we have jumped certain hurdles that we probably would have run right into had we not. Have patience and persistence. I have to remind people regularly that that paycheck that a channel rep gets, that partner seller has, that leader at that partner community, in that partner community, doesn't have an F5 logo on their paycheck. We have to make it interesting for them to care about us. We have to help them navigate this transformation as well. Your values are your brand. Those seeds planted with me 10 years ago, sitting in the lobby of F5's Agility Conference, are what I and my team are looking to achieve in our future motion. We want our partners to feel recognized, valued, and understood for what they can do to help us scale and grow our business. And taking that agile mindset is really important. This is not the channel programs or the go-to-markets that we all had in the past, especially for those of us who have been coming from a hardware legacy. We have to transition how we work. We have to change the partner value exchange. We need to look at different metrics for how we evaluate and reward our partners for working with us. So be agile. Build in an adjustment process. Tell your leadership that you're doing that. Tell your partners that you're doing that. Being transparent and helping them on this journey is our role. So as F5, as we look to renovate that older bridge of the past and head into this new era, I would tell you that we have an obligation as channel and industry leaders. We're facing the same challenges. How do we transform and bring our partners on the journey with us? Our evolution of the industry is not the time to abandon our channel, but rather to reinvent how we work with and through these partners. How do we take what we have today and make it better? Partners have helped us scale and grow in the past, and taking your partner with you on your journey is a force multiplier. Partners have never been more necessary to our success. They have never been more needed as we make this evolution and as we all grow. So from this channel leader to the industry leaders and channel leaders sitting with us today, I tell you, you've got this. You can take your partners on the journey. I know it's daunting, and like us, you've got challenges. You've got challenges with data, you have challenges with understanding within your own organizations. But you can, and you will, help them overcome that. Pick that place that you're going to start. Build your plan. Understand what you have to do to help the partner community do that. We can, as an industry, bring our partner community along with us on this journey. Thank you.